well. At Unity of Sacramento, we hold a vision of peace, prosperity, and unconditional love for all. And we are ever pressing toward the mark of this high calling that asks us to reimagine the world as it is in exchange for what it can be. And in service to that, I set out on an educational and transformational adventure of renewing my mind. And with your graciousness, I was successful at completing a Master of Religion in Public Life degree at Harvard Divinity School. The entire journey was a miracle. It was a miracle that I got in. It was a miracle that I got out. <laughs> uh, I'm just saying, you know. My, I, I, I threw everything in there, the good looks, all of it, you know. <laughs> Smiled a lot, uh, you know. <laughs> but while at Harvard, I studied with a mandate to bring something back that would enrich the lives of those in this ministry and our greater unity ministries, our unity worldwide ministries, and all people in general. Today, we begin what we're calling our Masterclass Sunday series. This series is my effort at building a bridge between Harvard and Unity with an intention of sharing the best of my experiences at Harvard and the best of our Unity experiences with our new friends and colleagues from Harvard. These masterclass events will bring some of the most authentic and committed voices, committed to the work of racial healing and justice and co-creating a world that works for all. A lot of these are my friends and colleagues that I got a chance to either study with or uh, learn from, spend time in classrooms with or outside of the class, and my life was enriched greatly by their presence. And as Marche said, um, she predicted that I would bring something back to share with you, and she was correct. And so Marche, this is round one, round one. While these services will be welcoming my friends and colleagues from Harvard, the Masterclass Sunday series is presented, sponsored, and is 100% a unity of Sacramento activity. In other words, when you finish this, you will not be getting a Harvard degree. You'll have to go to Harvard and get one yourself. <laughs> But this is not an, a Harvard-affiliated program, just to be clear. It is our way, my way of sharing with you. And I'm so very grateful for our first guest. By the way, our guest will be either coming to us on campus, like next week's guest, Morgan Curtis, will be with us on campus, or our guests will be coming to us virtually, like this week's guest. And this week's guest is one of my favorite people at Harvard. And I think one of Harvard's favorite people in general. Let me read a word about her and what will happen afterwards. I'll take a minute to give you some background about our guest today, who is the first in our Masterclass series. And then she will have some minutes to share some words with you. And then we'll get a chance to do some q and I'll, I'll, I'll do a brief interview with her. Is that all right? Now, since we have the dean, dean's gaze today, pretend like I've taught you to take notes. Just take, pretend like you're writing down, even if you're writing your name, address, and telephone number. You know, it's a master class. Just type it in the, you know, just those of you watching online, act like you know, okay? Just act like you know. Our guest today is the Associate Dean of Diversity, Inclusion, and Belonging, and lecturer on diversity, inclusion, and belonging at Harvard Divinity School. She is a Christ-centered minister 
and a racial justice and healing practitioner committed to a multi-faith, multidisciplinary, Afrocentric approach to healing justice rooted in the African philosophy of Ubuntu, restorative justice and love. Her passion for racial and social justice was cultivated at Howard University. That's the only thing I have to say that, you know, she, you know, Howard is the rival school to Morehouse, but other than that, at Howard University, where she received her undergraduate and law degrees. She is an attorney with nearly a decade's experience in public interest law. Through her experiences in Seattle practicing, as, at practicing law as an assistant attorney general, as a legal aid attorney with the Northwest Justice Project, and working as a mediator in King County Superior Court, it became clear to Melissa that the law could not facilitate the heart changes required to eradicate racism and oppression from individuals and systems. Her call to ministry led her to pursue her Master of Divinity at Harvard Divinity School. Melissa is earnestly committed to eradicating racism and oppression and advancing healing and societal transformation through spiritually engaged, heart-centered, multidisciplinary strategies rooted in love. She is a restorative justice practitioner and has studied restorative justice in Rwanda, transformational leadership in Ghana, and has published various articles exploring racial justice and healing. Dr. Bartholomew received her Master in Social Work from Boston College, where she received her PhD in social work as well. Her research interests include the impact of racism, incarceration, and other systems of oppression on the mental health of black people and the role of religion and spirituality in their resistance. She serves part-time faculty at Boston College where she teaches restorative justice at the School of Law and has taught diversity in the School of Social Work. And she's one of my favorites from Harvard Divinity School. Let's welcome to Unity of Sacramento, Dr. Melissa Wood Bartholomew. Welcome, Dean. Welcome. Can, can we hear Dean Melissa? Say something else, Dean, so can we can... Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear okay. you. Okay, thank you. Shall I begin? Yes, you got the mic. All right, thank you, thank you. And there's a bunch of happy, smiling faces here. Wonderful. Excited to see you. Thank you, let me just get my... I am uh, very excited to be here. I bring you greetings from Cambridge, Massachusetts. It is a privilege to be here with you all virtually this morning. I'm so grateful to Rev Kev for the invitation to be a part of this series. And it is a privilege to be able to help you start things off. I want to express my gratitude to him, to Reverend E and the rest of the Unity team for their gracious support in helping me to prepare for today. I, I truly appreciate the warm welcome that I've received. And I thank God for this new day, for breath in my body, I do not take one day, one moment, or one breath for granted as I sit here in Amen. all of my privilege, in my warm home, in my right mind. When I wake up in the morning, all I have to do is to take one moment to reflect on the fact that I am alive and breathing and I can gain an even deeper appreciation for just how much God loves me. And then when I think about what God allows me to do, providing opportunities like this to be a part of a conversation about love, I know even more deeply just how truly blessed I am. So I look forward to the conversation with Rev Kev um, a little bit later. Rev Kev has asked me to talk about the work that we're doing at Harvard Divinity School, work that he was involved in last year. So I will just take a few moments to share some reflections about some of the work that we have been doing to advance our vision of a restorative, anti-racist, and anti-oppressive Harvard Divinity School and of a world healed of racism and oppression and about our restorative justice approach and how this journey has brought us to this year's conversation about love. I'll, I'll start by reading from Bell Hook's text 
all about love, the, the text that we selected for our common read this year, and I'll tell you more about that. My dear friend, uh, Christabel always reminds me that when black people talk about healing, when they write about healing, it's scripture. So we're gonna begin by reading from Bell Hooks scripture this morning. All right. This passage is from chapter 12, which is entitled, Healing Redemptive Love. So before I begin, I invite you to take a moment to just focus on your breath and to breathe with intention. Feel free to close your eyes if that's comfortable for you. And as you breathe and listen to this scripture, draw your attention to the love within you that animates your breath. She writes, Love redeems. Despite all the lovelessness that surround us, surrounds us, nothing has been able to block our longing for love, the intensity of our yearning. The understanding that love redeems appears to be a resilient aspect of the heart's knowledge. The healing power of redemptive love lures us and calls us toward the possibility of healing. We cannot account for the presence of the heart's knowledge. Like all great mysteries, we are all mysteriously called to love no matter the conditions of our lives, the degree of our depravity or despair. The persistence of this call gives us reason to hope. Without hope, we cannot return to love. Breaking our sense of isolation and opening up to the window of opportunity, hope provides us with a reason to go forward. It is a practice of positive thinking. Being positive, living in a permanent state of hopefulness, renews the spirit. Renewing our faith in love's promise, hope is our covenant. In this passage, Hooks reminds us that our heart knows the truth of who we are. We are love, and we were made in love's image. And no matter how much ugliness we endure, how much pain, hatred, toxic stress from the world in the form of racism and other systems of oppression, the heart never forgets that truth, our truth. The heart's memory of the love that birthed it is what keeps us alive in the midst of unbearable pain. Mm. Our work as living, thinking, intellectual beings on the planet in these bodies is to love love with all of our hearts and all of our minds and all of our strength. We must never forget that we are here to fight for love and to protect our hearts. As the poet Nahira Wahid asserts, quote, your heart is the softest place on earth. Take care of it, she says. Mm. HDS, like unity, is a place that calls people back to the heart. To take care of it by working to eradicate the toxins from within. Our vision of a restorative anti-racist and anti-oppressive Harvard Divinity School and of a world healed of racism and oppression it's a call for all of us to return to love and to the work of justice. Because as the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. always reminded folks in the movement he gave his life for, it is not enough to just talk about love. We must also talk about justice. That's he right. said standing alongside love is always justice. But how do we lead through love in this work? Bell Hooks offers guidance in other parts of her text. It involves the practice of surrender. She writes, we cannot know love if we remain unable to surrender our attachment to power. If any feeling of vulnerability strikes terror in our hearts, lovelessness torments, end quote. Advancing justice and healing through love towards a vision of a beloved community requires vulnerability and a surrender of a kind of power that dominates and oppresses. Some people think that to show love in response to violence is a form of weakness. Those who see it as a sign of weakness don't realize just how hard it is. Mm -hmm. Or perhaps they do, and, and that's why they resist it. 
To be vulnerable and surrender our attachment to destructive power requires tremendous strength. These are sacred practices of love, and our HDS community has been engaged in these practices through restorative justice. For the last three years, our school has been applying restorative justice as an approach to advancing diversity, inclusion, and belonging, and equity and justice. When I began this role as Dean of Diversity in 2020, we started a Racial Justice and Healing Committee, which is comprised of students, faculty, and staff, and alums. And we soon cast a vision of building an anti-racism, anti-oppressive Harvard Divinity School. The aim of every initiative from, the DIB, from our DIB office is to advance this vision, which contributes to the vitality of the HDS community while cultivating an environment where everyone feels a sense of belonging and can flourish. DIB leads several initiatives designed to advance this vision, and I'll share a little bit about our primary uh, initiative, which is the Reorientation and Common Conversation Program, and our anchor program for this initiative is our Common Week Program. Our DIB office coordinates this collaborative school-wide initiative which was launched in the fall of 2020 by our Racial Justice and Healing Committee. It is a community-wide year-long series of community engagements aiming to help us reorient ourselves around our HGS values, our shared values and commitments, including respect, dignity, mutual understanding and trust with a particular focus on dismantling and healing from racism and oppression. The hope is that through our personal and community engagement with each book, we will individually and collectively deepen our understanding of the historical roots and manifestations of systemic racism and oppression in the United States. Our first book in 2020 was The Little Book of Race and Restorative Justice, Black Lives, Healing, and U.S. Social Transformation by Fania E. Davis. We held four large group community-wide virtual circle sessions covering themes of the text. And we held four small group circle sessions where students, faculty, and staff could engage with each other in a more intimate setting. And we facilitated each session through a restorative approach. And it created an atmosphere where people were able to be vulnerable and share about their struggles with learning history they didn't know, their personal experiences and frustrations, and their hopes and dreams for our capacity to build a beloved community. This restorative approach has been a critical component of our work. Restorative justice is a worldview rooted in indigenous wisdom and ancient circle practices that are part of indigenous cultures in various parts of the world. It is a way of life. It is an approach that helps us to expand our consciousness and transform our way of being in the world. It is rooted in relationships, in open hearts and open minds, and reminds us of the importance of prioritizing our own humanity and the humanity of each other, even those who have caused harm. Preserving the humanity of perpetrators of harm helps them to be accountable and take responsibility for their harm. The indigenous circle practices help keep us and help us to help us to recover the ancient wisdom within us that reminds us that we are all connected to each other. We are all of equal value. We are all connected to all living beings, all aspects of the natural world, the unseen world, to the divine, or to love if you do not claim a belief in the divine. It is a way to operationalize love and create a space for us to be love's vessel. It is a commitment to holding each other accountable for harm and addressing harm in a way that is rooted in love and compassion and addresses not only the one harmed, but the needs of the community that was impacted mm -hmm. and cares also for the one who perpetrated harm. No one is outside of the circle. The circle holds it all and us all. It helps us to dismantle destructive power structures that place certain people above others. And it helps us to heal through disentangling ourselves from the roots of the painful history of this country's origins and from the oppression, including sexism and classism, that are all part of this foundation, the foundation of this nation. This heart-centered, trauma-informed approach to harm, harm caused through interpersonal violence and oppressive systems, helps us to Resist the dominant culture and slow down. To be intentional and care for each other so that we can be fully present for each other and the work we've been called to do. It helps to create a space that illuminates the principle of Ubuntu, the philosophy indigenous to cultures all around the world. We, the, the philosophy that's indigenous and the philosophy that reminds us that a person is a person, 
through other persons. Mm -hmm. We followed the same model for our second year's common reprogram for our engagement with the text Red Nation Rising from Watertown Violence to, Na to Native Liberation by Nick Estes, Melanie Yazzie, Jennifer Nez Bintel, and David Correa. This book helped us to build on the foundation laid the first year as we explored the history of oppression of Native people in our country and contemporary manifestations of history, this history. Both books, Race and Restorative Justice and Red Nation Rising, prepared us well for our engagement with last year's Common Read text, which was the Legacy of Slavery at Harvard, Report and Recommendations of the Presidential Committee. This report details Harvard's entanglement with slavery, the funding it received from slavery, the stolen land and its contribution to the pseudo-race science that justified slavery. We engaged in this read together as a community throughout the year through the same restorative approach, with the intention of working towards furthering our vision of a restorative anti-racist and anti-oppressive HDS, helping the university implement and expand upon the recommendations in the report, and ultimately advancing a vision of a world healed of racism and oppression. We held our opening community-wide session to begin discussing the text last fall, and we had our dean and members of the academic and administrative leadership team engaged in circle conversation about what it means to read this report and how their own positionality impacts their engagement with it. And we held seven small group conversations about the report all throughout the year, which included identity-based affinity group spaces, where people were able to gather with members of the community who share their similar identities and hold more intimate conversations regarding this difficult history. We held our closing culminating circle celebration in the spring, where members of the community were able to share their experiences reading the report and the actions they've taken in response to the read. Our Racial Justice and Healing Committee selected All About Love by Bell Hooks for this year's read because we understand that our work advancing our vision of a restorative anti-racism and anti-oppressive HDS and of a world healed of racism and oppression over the last three years through each of these books that we read together as a community. We understand that this was a call back to love's way to care for our hearts and we needed to be equipped. Last year, as we journeyed through the Harvard Legacy of Slavery report, we began reckoning with the truth that we must break our soul ties to slavery. Mm. And those ties are anchored by fear. And as Hook says in her text, quote, the alchemy of perfect love that is able to vanquish fear and leave the soul free. We know that it's important to interrogate what love is and how we employ it as a strategy for social change within us on the inside the interior work as well as on the outside at the interpersonal and institutional levels. This is what those love activists involved in the civil rights movement did and they are calling us, our ancestors are calling us to follow their lead. Love is an essential ingredient in advancing our vision. It is also what cultivates an environment of inclusion and a sense of belonging and it helps to cast out the fear that keeps us apart and fuels systems of oppression. Hooks makes it very clear in her text that self-love is a foundation for any social change, and her text will help us to identify some of the barriers that are in the way of us loving ourselves and each other. We will engage with this text and talk about principles and practices we, we can embrace together as a community, and we'll continue to be in conversation with the Legacy of Slavery Report in interrogating the Divinity School's entanglement with slavery as well as our complicity in Harvard's work advancing pseudo-race science. Our role as a divinity school is to highlight the spiritual and moral implications of the haunting legacy of slavery and the supporting racist pseudoscience, and to frame this as a spiritual moral crisis that continues to impact not only institutions and systems, but every human heart and being on the planet. So Hook's text will help us to continue to go deeper below the surface for example, chapter seven in All About Love is a chapter on greed. We will talk about greed in connection to the lust for wealth and, and the wealth that animated the slave trade, the, the, the lust for wealth that animated the slave trade. And as well, we'll be, we'll be um, and as we will be continuing our work of healing and repair this year, we will be launching an initiative where we will begin building the HDS Truth, Reconciliation, Healing and Reparative Justice Commission. It will be our HGS version of a Truth and Reconciliation Commission rooted in love and healing through a restorative approach. As Hooks asserts, the heart of justice is truth-telling, 
seeing ourselves in the world the way it is. This work of reckoning with the truth to build a restorative anti-racist and anti-oppressive HCS and Harvard and advancing a vision of a world healed of racism and oppression is our urgent work of love. It is what our heart yearns for and we must answer the call and have the courage to do the hard work of eradicating racism and oppression on the inside out and journey back to our true selves as expressions of divine love. Amen. Amen. <laughs> Woo! You're getting some love and appreciation around here. Wow. Okay. Let me get myself adjusted here. I'm going to try and move a little closer here. Chris or someone, can we move the lectern out of the way here? Just maybe over here. And I'm going to slide over here so we can talk to Dean Melissa. Okay. Got to be very gentle with all these things. Um, I, I will not need it at this time. Okay, I just going to say I'm going to move it. Yeah, right we'll move here. it, move yeah. it over here, please. All right. Very carefully. Thank you. All right. Let's give Dean Melissa some more love and appreciation. Was that a lot? Imagine being in class with her. <laughs> uh, Dean Melissa, can you hear me well? Okay. Yes. Okay, great. And can we bring her audio up a little bit more in the house? Do you, would it be helpful if we brought her up just a little bit more? Okay, bring her up a little more, Chris. Can you say something else, Dean? Like Yes. Is that better? Yes, can you hear me okay. now? Okay, all right. Is that better? That's better, yeah. All right, so there's so many places I want to jump in um, and, and start with you on and some questions. But uh, while you were speaking, I was struck by all of your education that informed the work that you are engaged in now. Mm -hmm. Can you speak just a little bit to your trajectory and how you awaken to this purpose, to quote your, your bio a little bit, of being a, and I want to quote it correctly, a Christ-centered and racial justice mm -hmm. healing practitioner committed to a multi-faith, multidisciplinary, African-centric approach to healing justice rooted in the African philosophy of Ubuntu and restorative justice. Mm -hmm. and how, did you, how did you arrive? Because <laughs> you, you see, you, it's so important for us to hear this. I think it's so important for us to hear this. You know, how do people get to these places where they're so like alive with purpose and meaning? Was it like a straight road for you? How did, how did it happen for you? Thank you, Revka. That's a great question. It has been a journey. It has been a spirit-led journey, a journey uh, led by spirit and the ancestors. And I think the roots of the journey begin in my home, being raised by parents who are loving and uh, conscious of justice and equality and committed to that work. And then being raised in the church under my grandfather, the late Reverend Marcus Garvey Wood, who was also committed to justice and eradicating racism and advancing civil rights. And those seeds that were planted early on, even in the womb, began to build a consciousness that because I was blessed to have a beautiful family that allowed me to be able to be nurtured in a way that kept me on course and helped me to cultivate my intimacy with Christ, 
I was able to remain connected to the voice of the Lord all throughout my life and to be guided. So I appreciate the way you framed your question because it signals that you see the through line through all of it and that there is connective tissue. So it, it's not ex, it's not a situation where I've gone off course or tried to like figure out what I'm doing. I'm actually following the lead. Mm. And you know, by the time I got to college and at, at Howard specifically, at Howard University. And, and we listen, listen, listen. We forgive you for that. I'll just say this. Um, when Kamala Harris was here, I forgave her and absolved her of the same sin. But no, but no, Howard's the best. Go ahead. Go, go ahead, Dean. At Howard, at Howard, and you're being in that space, that container that cultivated so many um, pioneers for justice. Um, and learning, specifically, my, my, my major was, I was in school of communications, my major was legal communications, my minor was history. Learning about the civil rights lawyers, um, the black lawyers who advanced justice through the law, that's what compelled me to go to law school. Mm -hmm. And then staying you know, that, on that course and that trajectory and going through law school and going out into the field and being a lawyer, I just realized, you know, working within systems and working within the world, that you can't legislate heart changes. You, the law is just one component of the strategy for change. But this work is spiritual. This is warfare, and we need a little bit more. You know, and that's what the civil rights movement showed us. You know, that the, the movement was about spirit and about love, and their uh, capacity to to withstand these evils. You know, were as a result of their spirit. So I knew I needed to develop the capacity to be a minister and a social justice change agent and have those skills um, and to add to my toolbox. And that's what led me to Harvard Divinity School. And then when I got to Divinity School and work in the world, uh, while at Divinity School, realized, okay, then there needs to be a little bit more because there's the psychological implications of the impact of racism that we have to address um, that also must be healed. So it's just the, the, the Lord has been expanding my toolbox and capacity to address the multiple dimensions of this wound that racism and oppression um, have caused. Wow. Wow. Phenomenal. So would you then say that formal education, at least in your journey, formal education can be utilized toward your spiritual approach to racial healing and reconciliation? Yes, and I, you know, I could throw the same question back at you. <laughs> Definitely. Absolutely. And I'll say this because growing up in the church, mm -hmm. growing up in the Baptist church, because your question was about the framing of being a Christ-centered minister. Mm -hmm. I knew growing up intuitively that we were putting God in the box, that we were putting Jesus in the box. Mm -hmm. And I developed this desire to want to travel the world and study religions so I could learn more about God and learn more about Jesus. Mm -hmm. Well then, so going to HDS as a student for my master's of divinity was an opportunity to do that because you're in this container with people who are of all faiths and people who don't claim a faith. And so the learning that you experience in the classroom and outside the classroom is incredible as you know. So I went to HDS mid-career after being in the, in the law in the legal field for almost 10 years. I went specifically in response to my call to ministry as a Christ-centered minister, so I could develop the capacity to be a translator of the gospel and translate the gospel across faiths. Mm. And I was able to do that at, at Harvard Divinity School. I was able to learn uh, what I knew intuitively. I was able to just confirm that mm -hmm. um, Jesus and God is broader, bigger than the box I had put him in. So the education experience at HGS specifically in that container help to cultivate a, a broader consciousness, my God consciousness, my divine consciousness, even more broadly. Um, so it was a transformative three years for me. Pause for applause, please. They, they've been trying to give you. They, they've been trying to give you that. Amen. We, we give thanks. I, I knew that was. 
I, I knew that was coming, so I just wanted you to... I know these people a little bit. So just one more take on this question, and it's, it's particularly to folks who are in the struggle of, as we say around here, awakening to their uh, divine potential and being a force for good in the world. In the struggle, I'm still, I'm struggling with what is mine to do. And you talked about this listening and following. How, how can they do that? How, how can we do that? That listening that guides us to make career changes, go back to school, take, what is that? that and how do we get that? How do we do that? You do what you're, you're doing in your service. I love the fact that you incorporate time in your worship service for meditation, for stillness, and you carry that into your every day. Mm. Um, my spiritual practices increased profoundly when I was a law student um, at Howard. It was such a it was such a <laughs> such a hard experience. It just you know you grow closer to the Lord. But ironically, it just, as I learned the law, I grew deeper in my intimacy with Christ and developed practices, spiritual disciplines that helped me to develop the capacity to hear God's voice in my own way. And that capacity to hear has served me well all throughout my, the rest of my life. So practices of prayer, practices of worship, practices of stillness, um, and then later in life, in when I got to divinity school, I was exposed to uh, transcendental meditation. So meditation, uh, an intentional meditation practice really opened up for me the capacity to hear God's voice. And it was distinct, a distinct practice from prayer. Prayer had always been petitioning and intercessory, praying for the needs of others and my own. But the meditation practice opened up the space for me to really be able to hear God and just allow God to deposit into me. Um, those, so those practices, walking and, and sitting by the river and really leading into ancient practices that go back to our West African roots, um, just allowing the ancestors to, uh, to be present. And in the last few years, I've really been awakened to the, the, the presence of the ancestors and the guidance from my ancestors and that's been informative as, as well. So the daily disciplines in the mornings, most mornings, particularly the mornings before I go to work, I spend at least an hour in the presence, cultivating connection and practices, meditation, meditating on the word of God, meditation, meditating on other scriptures and reflecting, writing in, in a gratitude journal, reflecting on God's grace, all of those ways to plug in, to cover myself, put on that full armor of God, so that I can move in the spirit and in tune with God's direction so that I'm not operating in my own strength. I can't do this work, all that you just heard me outline. None of it is through my own strength. All of it is through the divine's strength and spirit. So cultivating the connection through the practices, spiritual disciplines is how I'm able to hear the voice of God and then cultivate the habit of taking those leaps of faith and trusting God. So mm. being able to mid-career leave from my work in Seattle and carry my family across country to Cambridge to start a master's of divinity school you know, program uh, mid-career, mid-life. I only was able to do that because I had a clarity of call that came from my ability to hear God clearly and know that God was guiding us. And it's only when you have that clarity of knowing that you can do those things that seem completely ridiculous, as you know, <laughs> because you're trusting and knowing that if God has called you to do it, God will provide. All right. So those practices have helped me to really, really um, cultivate my capacity to listen and to hear God's voice in the way that is particular to me. Amen. Amen. I think they like you around here. So you mentioned the ancestors quite a bit, and I participated in your course, which was just one of the greatest responses to my question. Part of my entire time being at Harvard, I was 
engaging in the question, what is my greater purpose in being here? What is my greater purpose in being here? I'm always um, trying to find the, the connection between, you know, the, the intellectual and the spiritual, you know, and, and, and the greater role that I am to play. I always feel I'm sent somewhere. I didn't just go, but I feel sent, and I felt sent there. And so this course that you taught, Exploring Racial Justice and Healing Through the Life of Harriet A. Jacobs, was a confirmation. Not only was it a confirmation in many ways of why I was at Harvard, but also, as uh, Dean Melissa uh, talked about, Harvard's reckoning with its legacy of slavery and seeking to find an approach toward addressing it. And so in my class with Dean Melissa, we addressed it every single week in a very profound and unique way. Talk to us a little bit about, first of all, who is Harriet A. Jacobs, and why was she the ancestor that you chose for us to study? Uh, tell us a little bit about your pedagogy, because it was a very different kind of classroom than other classes. And, you know, in fact, we, there were some classes at Harvard, all of them were magnificent. Did you hear what I said? They were all what? All of my professors were magnificent. All of my professors were what? But there were some. <laughs> we did some things in this course that were transformative. And I, I would say that for myself and my colleagues, including my colleague that will be with us next week, who was in the course, uh, Morgan Curtis. Tell us a little bit about why you chose that pedagogical approach to addressing the report and helping us to process through racial healing and, yes. and justice at, at Harvard. Well, first of all, thank you for those generous comments um, and for your vibrant participation in the course, which we'll talk about. Um, part of what led me to Harvard Divinity School as a student was the desire to interrogate the role of spirit in social change, to examine um, social change, social transformation at the, in, at the intersection of spirituality and transcendence. Mm. And our people our formerly enslaved ancestors, um, many of them provide such a beautiful example of how to not only survive through oppression, but to thrive and to maintain your eye on freedom and liberation, not only for yourself, but for the collective, mm -hmm. for your, your people and, and a broader humanity. And Harriet Jacobs, uh, wrote her own scripture. She wrote her own narrative. So that's number one. She has a complete narrative that she has written, that she wrote, that gives us um, this roadmap for a life of one who, although was haunted by her slave master, through her family, the love of her grandmother, the love of her children, the love of her parents, through her connection and faith in God, was able to survive that trauma and strategize to liberate herself and her children and to be an abolitionist when she freed herself. So what perfect scripture, what perfect example, what better example than someone like a Harriet Jacobs um, to show us the way, to help us to understand what it means to be a racial justice and healer, healing practitioner, what it means to be someone who's committed to racial justice and is able to stay rooted in love to say rooted in a spirit consciousness under the most oppressive conditions. We will never, we will never experience what Harry J experienced. That's why in my opening, I just commented on the fact that I'm sitting here in the midst of privilege. I'm sitting here in the comfort of my home. We will never experience what she experienced in her life. And, and you know, because you read the text, there was a, a pivotal period in her life where she was really, really under some duress. And I commend everyone in your, your community to read her narrative. She was able to hold on to love. She, like so many of her ancestors, were able to hold on to love um, and not let hate sully her and, and, and um, corrupt her spirit. That's powerful. So we owe it to the ancestors to study them with rigor. So out of respect for her, out of respect for those like her, 
and out of a need to have an, have an example for my students of myself that was an example of a person who could give us some real tools on what it means to cultivate intimacy with the spirit as a way, as a strategy for liberation, we studied her text as scripture. And it just so happens that she is noted in the Harvard and Legacy of Slavery Report because when she became free, she spent time in Cambridge, she ran a boarding house for Harvard affiliates, and one of her relatives who was, a, a, it was allowed into Harvard was not allowed uh, to live on campus. So her, her story is referenced in the report. So it was through divine providence that my course came together at the time that it did to be in conversation with this report and to help build um, you and others and all of us uh, who are engaged in that scripture, build us in a way um, that gave us deep, deeper insight into what we were reading. Mm. We took a, a restorative approach in the class. So the class, we built an altar in the class. We, yes. we did meditation in the class. We, we did centering practices. And in reading her narrative and in reading the Harvard and Legacy of Slavery report, we were also being, we were reliving some of this traumatic history. So tell us why it was necessary to start and engage class yes. in, in, the, in the way that we were. And, and, if, and if we do this work here or other work for those who are uh, engaged in um, restorative justice work or racial healing work or all of that. Why is it important to use a, a, a restorative approach? Yes. A restorative approach is really a trauma-informed approach. And by that, I mean it takes into consideration that we are human beings. We have feelings. We have been traumatized. Um, trauma with big T, trauma with little t. And when we come together to talk about these hard subjects, this hard history, there is a potential for people to be triggered. There's a potential for people to um, feel all the feelings. And we actually want people to feel because part of the work of healing involves feeling. But in order to do that well, um, you have to set the container. You have to create the conditions so that you're not um, creating an environment where people actually become uh, harmed. So mm -hmm. the restorative approach um, allows us to be intentional about practice of cultivating a container of connection. So we start every class session with breathing, meditation, music, a way of, of helping us to settle in. We go around the table and each person is able to check in and share how they're feeling, what's coming up for them, how they're feeling. So you can bring your full self to the circle. And we're focusing on that centerpiece that's in the middle of the table that contains sacred items that each person has brought as a way to help keep us grounded throughout the entire class so that we stay focused on the reality and the truth that we're all connected. And then we check out with each other at the end of the circle, at the end of the class, so that we know, we share what we're taking away with. All of this creates intimacy and connection so that you're building this layer, this connective layer of community while you're dealing with this very, very hard, hard subject. Mm -hmm. um, and it's a way to help us really um, cultivate a deeper connection to ourselves while we're connecting to each other. Powerful. And I, I just want to add here, as we are inviting, you know, when we're thinking about our vision of co-creating a world of peace, prosperity, and unconditional love for all, this is how we get at it. You know, it's not a Pollyannish kind of um, wishful thinking sort of thing, but it is through deep engagement and being connected e with each other. And so when we are having the belong circles, we are using a restorative practice such as the one Dean Melissa just spoke about. So the next time you hear us announcing belong circles, I invite you to be a part of it because this is how we break down and break through toward not only holding this, that the vision as something that is a, a theoretical imaginary future, but we actually embody it. And that was a transformational component I yes. experienced uh, with my colleagues. We now belong to each other. Those colleagues that we connected with in Dean Melissa's course, we belong to each other. And we will be doing work in the world, all over the world, be, because we sat 
inside of, as Bell Hooks talked about, the ugliness. We sat with that ugliness and we lived past it with a restorative approach. So I just want to uh, invite those of us who are like really committed to it, that this is part of the way forward, that we sit in circle um, with it all. And as Dee Melissa mentioned, the circle holds it all. I'm looking at the clock. We got time for like one more question. Can you believe it? Um, not that I'm verbose or anything, but <laughs> are you enjoying it so far? So a question in two parts. One question in two parts. We, 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 had, we had Dr. Cordell West here at uh, last, what, a couple weeks ago. And so backstage, I said, um, Dr. West, now we know you are a philosopher and you are a thinker and you, you can, you know, but a lot of people want to ask you questions. So can you answer each question in one part and not 12 parts? Because <laughs> he could. And he, he, he answered them in what? In what, two parts? At least seven and a half, seven and a half part. All right, he, he shaved back. <laughs> okay, so something powerful happened in our class. Um, and I hope we, okay, something powerful happened in our class. You gave us a final assignment that kind of led us to get creative. And I created with my colleague, um, Brother Ahmad Edmund, a service for racial healing, reconciliation, repentance, and repair that brought together our colleagues on the campus um, and the dean of the, uh, the college, the dean of the Divinity School, as well as Dane and Constance Perry. Dane Perry is a direct descendant of the largest slave trading family in US history. Take a breath, right? And we invited them into a service using the approach that we, a restorative approach, but in the context of a service in order to invite those parties, those representatives of this history to to engage in a confession about it, you know, to, to engage in a repentance of it, and to make commitments for repair. And they did. And they did. And Dane, Dane Perry, <laughs> Dane and Constance Perry will be here as a part of the series. So you will get to meet them and hear of their extraordinary transformation. D. Melissa, you also participated in that service, and I wonder if you could give us a takeaway, your takeaway from that experience, and what it, maybe give me some you know, feedback on what might be valuable about doing things like that in the future. Well, first of all, it was your creative response to um, my invitation for you all to be creative. I said you could either write a paper or you could do a project. And so you wanted to create a service for Harriet Jacobs and uh, a funeral service. And part of that service, you included this powerful litany, this litany of atonement. And I think um, what was so powerful about it is that you highlighted um, a component of restorative justice. Sometimes in, oftentimes in restorative justice, there can be circles where there are, um, you're not able to access the perpetrator of harm, but the surrogates, the representatives of the ones who committed harm can be in circle and can be an important part of that healing process. So your service actually created that space for Dane to be a surrogate of, of you know, his ancestors. And um, it was a powerful example of how an institution can respond to this critical live work of healing and repair in a very tangible way. And we were very blessed that our Dean at the time, David Hinton, was willing to engage in that, ser that service. Um, and it was, it was uh, beautiful, it was sacred, and it was something that was a very, uh, will, will remain a very important part of the history 
of, of HES and of our, our movement through this uh, Harvard Legacy of Slavery experience. Mm. Thank you. Uh, and we will send you a link in this coming week's e-blast so that you can see, um, see it for yourself and experience it for yourself. Now, we are inviting Unity of Sacramento to join with the Harvard Common Read this year. And the book is entitled All About Love. And I heard some of us already got the book. Who already got the book? I heard some folks shout, look at you, holding up the book. Look at God. Look at God. All right. So I'm asking, since this is master class, right? Okay. We're going to dedicate our coffee clutch time to processing through all about love. Got it? I know you aren't up on it right now, okay? But next week when we come together, please, you know, start reading. Give us an assignment, Dean. Give us, a, give us an assignment. Sure. Sure. So I, I um, thought of a question, a okay. uh, prompt that you might want to use. Okay. Um, and here it is. So she, Bell Hooks takes us through this work of, uh, of self, self love and self inquiry, self examination. So the question I have is uh, all about love is all about ourselves. Hooks really helps create a path to self examination so that we can remove barriers that are in the way of us loving ourselves. Self love is the foundation for societal change, for building a beloved community. Um, so here's your prompt. The question is where's my question? Um, uh, Take your time. I lost. Okay, wait a minute, just a moment. Stand by. The question they're, is: They're eager for homework, so you know. Are you holding on to pain? This is the question. Are you holding on to pain from a past hurt that allows you to justify not truly loving someone else? Wow. Are you holding on to pain from a past hurt that allows you to justify not truly loving someone else? And that someone else could be a person, a group of people, or a place. Are you holding on to pain from a past hurt that allows you to justify not truly loving someone else? Uh, Dean Melissa, everybody in the church is nodding up and down like this. <laughs> We're going to have confession after this. I, I will say this in, in closing. Dean Melissa has taken the same approach in our classroom and moved it across the entire Divinity School, and I would dare say the university, that when, when she calls on us, everybody shows up. And I, I want you to know why I want to stay engaged in this work, why I am staying engaged in this work, because I, I truly believe that um, for better or for worse, as goes Harvard, so goes the nation. You get that? And so in any way that I can be involved to ensure that Harvard is an anti-racive, anti-oppressive, restorative university, I believe its influence in the world will be the result. And I thank you in advance for the ways you have supported and will support us doing that. Let's give our Dean some love and appreciation. Thank you, Dean. Thank you. Thank you for having me. To God be the glory. Thank you so much. We're going to do our homework, we promise. All right. All right. Let's have some music, guys. <laughs>